Good morning. Good morning, everyone. If you could come on in and take a seat. It's good to have you here um, with us. Um, it is uh, 1015 Eastern Standard Time. Um, I don't know how many of you were here an hour, hour ago, came into the parking lot and realized, oops, I didn't set my clocks. I don't know how many people in the first service were actually here at 730 instead of 830 and then turned around. Um, but one way or the other, you are now here uh, at the correct time. And so I'm grateful for, for that. When you came in, um, you should have received a, a bulletin. If you didn't, or if you are watching us uh, online, then that bulletin is uh, available in its uh, a full form on our website under Sunday Worship Materials. Um, and on the website, there's also lots of information, a calendar of things that are happening in life of the church. But I want to just point out a couple of things uh, that are uh, new to that uh, announcement section of the bulletin this morning. Uh, first, in your, uh, in your bulletin, there's a little insert. Uh, it relates to uh, today. Today is the uh, International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. This is sponsored by an organization called Voice of the Martyrs. And so um, they seek to highlight uh, the, uh, the impact of persecution to Christians around the world. And, um, and so we're going to be praying uh, for that as part of our pastoral prayer uh, later this morning. Um, second, if you are interested, um, you're, you're welcome to attend, but if you're just interested in joining in online, uh, a church uh, in our denomination uh, down in South Jersey in Cherry Hill is going to be hosting a Reformation Day service this evening. Uh, it marks, uh, commemorates uh, the symbolic start of the Protestant Reformation on October 31st, 1517, when Martin Luther uh, publicly protested some of the abuses within the Roman Catholic Church at the time um, and sort of ignited a firestorm across uh, Germany and ultimately across Europe and the world as the church rediscovered the gospel of grace, the gospel that we're going to be talking about this morning. And so at six o'clock, um, Covenant Presbyterian in Cherry Hill is going to be hosting a, a service for churches in our area. Uh, all you have to do is Google Covenant Presbyterian Cherry Hill. It'll take you to their website, and uh, you should be able to find information there. Um, third, we're going to be starting, and still working on kind of the format of this, but we're going to be starting a three-week uh, online version a discussion in November uh, to explore church membership. Uh, I've reached out to many people already who have expressed uh, interest and in, uh, we're going to try to do this in uh, not, the, not the traditional way, but nothing is traditional this year. Um, and um, if you're interested, this is, an ob is not an obligation to membership, but if you're interested in learning more, exploring the vision for Calvary, then contact me uh, and let me know about that. Finally, um, let me uh, just point out, uh, new on the calendar, uh, but typical on the calendar for us, but we're going to have a Thanksgiving Eve service, November the 25th at 7 o'clock. Uh, 7 p.m. on November the 25th, so mark that on your calendar. Uh, we're going to do that here, um, and we'll make that uh, available online as well, uh, at the very least in recorded form. So um, that's, that's it for things that I want to highlight, but uh, take your bulletin. There's a number of items that are uh, listed there from prior weeks, things that are continuing to happen in the life of the, of the church. Uh, let me focus your attention uh, now to our order of service. Uh, we are here to worship God. It is the reason by which or for which God is calling his people together. And so we use uh, Psalm 40, verses 1 to 3, as the, uh, the impetus for that, the instrument by which God calls us to worship this morning. I'm going to read this out loud as we begin to worship. Psalm 40, verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Our Father, we thank you for inclining to us. That you came to us in the midst of our struggle, in the midst of our sin, in the midst of our rebellion, and you took radical steps to pull us out and to place us upon a firm foundation and to secure us with an eternal hope. We pray, Lord, that that eternal hope would be at the forefront of our worship this morning. 
that we would look to you as the one who comes to us, who saves and rescues us and strengthens us in the midst of our struggle. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. It is, um, it's appropriate on any Sunday, but particularly on a Sunday where we come to the Lord's table to celebrate the Lord's Supper, uh, to recognize that the reason why we are invited to the table is because God makes it possible for us to be there. Uh, the reason why communion with Him is possible is because He has made it possible through the work of Jesus Christ. And so it's appropriate to recognize both corporately and individually our fallenness, our sin, our rebellion against God, and to know that through Jesus Christ, those sins are forgiven. So let me invite you to take a look at the words here from our corporate confession of sin. And I want us to pray these words out loud together and then take a moment and silently come before God and confess those areas of your life where you know you've fallen short of God's perfect standard. Let's pray together. Almighty God, who shows mercy to all who call upon you, hear us as we come to you and confess our sins and seek forgiveness. We know that we have broken your perfect standards by our actions, by our words, by the misplaced desires of our hearts. We confess our rebellion, our ingratitude, and our misplaced desire to live our own way, by our own strength, and for our own glory. Have mercy on us, O God, and from your great goodness, enable us to serve and please you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We are confronted with the truth of our rebellion against God. But, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Saved by grace, held fast by grace through Jesus Christ. Let's stand and sing of this beautiful truth.
And let's pray together uh, for the needs of God's church. This is our pastoral prayer time, a time when I pray out loud, but we join together in prayer for uh, the things that God calls us and commands us to pray for. Now, as we pray for congregational needs, and because this is being uh, live streamed on the internet and available as a recording later, I'm not going to use names as I make these uh, prayer requests known. Um, but some of us may recognize some of the situations, and God, of course, knows all of the names associated with them, and it does not diminish in any respect uh, our heart's desire to see God act in the lives of our brothers and sisters in this church. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you invite us and command us to bring our requests to you with thanksgiving, uh, with a recognition of what you've done for us and meeting our greatest need, you tell us to come with the needs of our daily lives. And so, Lord, we do that. We lift up to you those areas where uh, these needs have been expressed to us, knowing that you hear not just the ones expressed, but those that are not expressed verbally as well. We pray for one among us who is waiting to have a, an MRI, uh, trying to detect the cause of abnormal findings in blood work. We pray that you would grant approval for that MRI and that all the details of insurance and scheduling would come together to make that happen. We pray for one who is looking for employment, and we thank you for uh, an interview process that is ongoing and is happening uh, even at this moment. And we pray that you would... Um, Give favor in the eyes of those who are considering our brother as an applicant for this job. We pray that if it is your will and this is the best place for him, that you would open the door and make it so. Pray for another among us who recently had surgery, and we thank you for uh, her early and continued recovery. We pray that that would continue to be the case. Pray for another among us who received in the last few weeks uh, diagnosis that cancer with which he had struggled with years ago has returned. Pray for him as he restarts therapy and ask that you would give him energy and focus and hope in the midst of these treatments and that the treatments would indeed uh, reduce the lesions that are present. Pray for another among us, no longer a member here at this church, but a longtime member who will be having surgery in, um, in a week. And we Pray that you would give her um, strength as she approaches that. We pray that you would continue to give her peace and that you would bring success from the surgery. 
Lord, we pray for um, another among us who is continuing uh, training to become a chaplain. Pray that you would be with him in his studies, that you would help him to raise the necessary support, and that you would provide for him and his family during this time as he seeks to follow your call for vocational ministry. Lord, we pray for those among us who are or have children uh, who not yet at this moment are following you. Uh, For those who are either actively or consciously not following uh, you or whose lives do not match their profession of faith, we know that you are the one, the only one who can change their hearts, and we pray that that is exactly what you would do. Lord, we pray for our local community and our nation this week as we either have or will be voting for office holders from the president down to local offices. We pray for wisdom to be able to make wise decisions, to use the responsibility that you have given to us as citizens well. We pray for the safety of all of those in our communities, for those in our neighborhoods going to vote, for our leaders, those who are honestly um, seeking to follow you and are currently in office, from those who are not consciously following you. Lord, we pray that you would nonetheless protect them and move and remove leaders as you see fit. We pray that you would forgive us for our sins and for our lax attitudes and taking our responsibility too lightly and ask that you would intervene and bring peace to our nation. Lord, we pray for the church around the world that is experiencing persecution. We pray that our brothers and sisters who have lost everything at the hands of others who are persecuting them for their faith, that they would experience the peace of Christ, that you would give success to the efforts of organizations like Voice of the Martyrs that seek to help them rebuild and strengthen and empower them to be a witness for you in the midst of great loss. We pray that those Christians who have experienced persecution will experience your provision for all of their needs. And we pray for those who oppress and for those who persecute that they would see the truth of the one true God, that they would repent and come to faith in Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that we get to be a part of your working around the world through the giving of our tithes and offerings. We thank you that we get to participate in that on a regular basis, and we thank you that you allow us to worship you in that way. Thank you for the generosity of your people and use their gifts, we pray, to serve your church. And now we pray for the study of your word, that it would be fruitful in our hearts and our lives, that it would strengthen us and encourage us, that it would challenge us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's do that now. Let's study God's Word together. And if you have a Bible, let me invite you to pull out Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. Those verses will be up on the screen as I read them, but it's always useful if you have a Bible or a device on which the Bible is easily accessible to pull that up, because I'll often make reference to it as we go through and talk about it. But Um, This passage here, these three verses, actually one of the most complete, one of the most succinct summaries of Christianity that I think you'll find in the Bible. Incredibly worthwhile to commit to memory if you're looking for a place to start in Bible memorization. Um, this um, uh, This is the core of what Christianity is all about, specifically as it relates to how we are made right with God. So let me ask you to stand if you're able and listen as I read it. It's very simple. It's three verses, and as I conclude, I'm going to declare that this is the Word of God, recognizing that to be so, and invite you to respond with thanksgiving by saying thanks be to God. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So when I was a when I was a junior in college at the University of Delaware, um, I first um, really understood the doctrines of grace by studying the Book of Ephesians. A group of guys on my floor. Uh, my dorm room, uh, were gathering together. They invited me to join them, studying the book of Ephesians. And it's there that I really began to understand for the first time what it meant to be saved 
by grace. And I have to admit that at the time, I was incredibly grateful for that, but I didn't fully grasp it and fully understand it. But I did, and it didn't stop me. I did have conversations with other people about how great this grace is and what it means that we're not saved by anything that we do. We're only saved by the work of God on our behalf. But it was interesting. I got in a conversation one time with a friend of mine toward the end of my junior year, a friend who also came from a Christian tradition, and I was making this point. I said that this is how we're saved. And the friend responded by saying, I, I, don't, know that I, can, I don't know that I can believe that. I don't know that that can be true. And she said, she said I'm, if I'm saved by grace, this is how the logic was working for her, then, then doesn't that just mean that I get to do whatever I want? The, the argument would go like this. It is, uh, th- this is the argument. You say, if you tell someone that how they live and what they do aren't the basis for whether someone is granted entrance into heaven then you've taken away any reason for them to do that which is good. And then they can do, right, whatever they feel like, whatever they want. And how does a society function like that? That's how the argument would go. That's the grace objection. Very common. If God has freely given me salvation on the basis of his grace, then does it mean now that I get to do whatever I want? And Paul goes about addressing that objection in much more detail in other places, specifically in the book of Romans, but probably in one of its most succinct forms right here in Ephesians chapter 2. In fact, this is actually one of the first places that I would take someone who has the grace objection to say this is how what you do and what God has done relate to one another. It's very simple. That's what Paul's doing in in these three verses. He's telling us how we're saved and how it relates to what we do. And so this is the outline. Very simple. It's not terribly complicated or terribly creative on my part. We are saved by grace, through faith, for good works. Those are the three points. By grace, through faith, for good works. That's how we're saved. Now, first, by grace. How have you been saved? Verse 8 tells us, for by grace you have been saved. That seems simple enough, right? This is the exact same statement that Paul makes in verse 5 that we didn't read, but immediately proceeds by a couple of verses, verse 8. By grace you have been saved. Now, he repeats it, so it's got to be important, right? That's true. And it is, which is why we spent the entirety of last week looking at this concept of grace. And I'm not going to repeat everything I said last week. You have the access to be able to go back and hear it again if you want. But let's just define, just to be clear and on the same page, what is grace? Grace is, here's a definition for you. Grace is God's unmerited favor that not only offers salvation but secures it on our behalf it says you have been saved it does not say you've been given a second shot it doesn't say well let's try this again it doesn't say let's give you a second chance it's it's not saying let's see how it goes next time we'll reset to zero that's not what it says The verb, you have been saved here, is in a tense that indicates that this grace, this this salvation, has been fully secured for us by grace. It's a gift. It's not in question, and it's nothing that we've done. Grace is God, rich in mercy, taking the spiritually dead and making them alive again. Not because you're good enough, not because you're smart enough, not because most people like you. Not because God looked at you and saw potential. God, it is God loving us by paying a debt that we could never have paid and giving us a gift that we never deserved. Right? That's point number one. That's grace. We are saved by grace. Now, point number two. We've been saved by grace through faith. Right? That's what it says. Verse eight. Just keep reading. By grace you have been saved through faith. Through faith, it says. Which means... That the means by which we receive the grace of God is our faith in Jesus Christ, our belief in what he has done. Now, the kind of faith by which we receive salvation, this kind of faith is commonly said to consist of three parts. You'll often hear uh, commentators and theologians kind of saying, for, for faith to be true faith, for it to be biblical fra- faith, it has to have at, at least these three components, right? First, you have to understand the facts of something. This this relates to everything. For you to have real faith in something, you have to understand three things. First, you have to understand the facts of something. 
You have to accurately understand what that something is. Now, secondly, you have to believe that those facts are true. And it's one thing to just say, like, okay, I get it. But the next step is to say, I get it, and I think it's true. Now, third, and very importantly, it's not enough to just say, I get it, and I think the facts are true. You actually have to put your trust in them. Right? It's like looking at a chair and saying, like, oh, a chair will hold my weight. That's the claim. I believe it. It's very different, though, when you actually sit in it. Why? Because you're willing at that point to not only state accurately the facts about the chair, not only to believe in your head that they're true, you're actually willing at that point to rest your weight upon it. Let me give you a, a, a more fun kind of illustration. Um, one of the most famous tightrope walkers in all of uh, history is a guy by the name of Jean-Francois Gravelet which is not how he was known, but it's far cooler to say Jean-Francois Gravelet than it is the name by which he was known, and that's the Great Blondine, or Blondin, depending upon who you, who you hear say it. The Great Blondine is known for being the first person to walk a tightrope wire across Niagara Falls. Now, I think in technical fact, it wasn't over the actual falls themselves. It was just, just down from them. So he was walking, but he's still, he's walking over the rapids. Right? Rocks below. He's about 160 feet above the rocks when he's doing this. On a wire that's moving, remember. It's not like you can, like it's perfectly taut. Like it sags in the middle. So it's swaying. And, and the distance that he's walking on this wire, 160 feet above the rapids and the rocks, is about 1,300 feet long. Now, for point of reference, that's more than four football fields that he's walking. And this is in, this is in 18... 1859, and there was no video uh, uh, recording of it. There was no TV crew to broadcast it live. And lots of people, as you might expect when this was reported in the papers, thought it was all made up, thought it was a hoax. So he did it lots of times. He did it many times just to demonstrate the fact that he could do it. And he didn't just do it. He didn't just walk across it. Once he walked across backwards, uh, once he walked across with a, um, a, a sack over his head, just feeling with his feet where he was going, once with a wheelbarrow, once he even stopped halfway, lowered a line to a boat that was kind of secured in the, in the middle of the, of the river below, pulled up a piece of cake and some champagne and sat down on the wire, ate and drank, lowered it back down and then continued on his way. He was the great Blondine. Now, all that is documented as true, I believe. But what, what comes next is one of the legends that I, I couldn't actually find as to whether or not it actually happened this way. But it's one of the legends uh, that go along with the great Blondine. He gets to the other side of the wire one time, and he says to the crowd, and he specifically calls out a man in the crowd, one of the most enthusiastic cheers, and he says, do you believe that I could even walk across this wire with a man on my back? Now, in some, of the, in some of the accounts of the story, uh, the man is the Prince of Wales. In some cases, it's just some random guy. But he says to him, do you believe that I could walk across the wire with a man on my back? And, of course, you can almost pre predict the response. The guy's like, yeah, I believe you can do it. I just saw you do it. Right? I saw the facts. I believe, that, I believe that it's true, sure. Now, what's Blondine's response? You can probably predict this, too. Right? What's he say? Hop on. Let's go. And it's at that point, of course, the man bucks, oh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, no, not me. Maybe someone else. Called his bluff, right? That's what Jesus did to me my junior year as I was studying the doctrines of grace. Are you just going to think about this? Are you just going to say this is true in your head? Are you actually going to trust in this? Calls our bluff. Where are you with Jesus? I mean, that's the logical question. He's far more capable of carrying your weight across a far greater chasm than the great Blondine over the Niagara Falls. And unlike the guy who's sitting on the side, one side of the falls, who, who actually, if, you know, if we're all honest, is perfectly safe just staying where he is. Right? Unlike in that case, our lives actually do depend, our eternal lives actually really do depend upon whether or not Jesus can take us to the other side of the chasm. So are you willing to do that? Are you willing to put your life in his? Are you willing to hop on? And this, it says in verse 8, look back. This faith even is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works. See, it's a gift. 
Now, it's easy for us to kind of say, because we've said it repeatedly, that grace, God's grace that he's given to us, is a free gift that we can claim no credit for. We have an easier time maybe with that, but the way that this sentence is phrased, so is the faith. This, the, the, the pronoun this, and I'll, I'll spare you all the, 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 the Greek details as to where that conclusion comes from, but, but this is the important takeaway. That this is referring to both grace and faith, both. Salvation in every respect is not from ourselves. Both are gifts. Neither are earned. Right? They don't result from, verse 9, from works. Now, here's where we encounter that term, works. Right? What are works? Well, it's basically anything, anything that we would do. In a narrow kind of uh, sense of the Jewish law, it is specifically works of righteousness, and Paul talks about that in many cases. But he's speaking, in this case, to both Jews and non-Jews, mainly probably non-Jews in the churches that he's writing to in the church at Ephesus. And so, and so it's, it's really, in any respect, any human effort to, to accomplish something. Anything we do is not something that we can trust in when it comes to our salvation. We're not saved by our works in any respect. Now, this is where we can insert back into the discussion what we brought up a second ago, the grace objection, right? All right, this is where it comes back. Okay, if God has freely given me the gift of salvation on the basis of grace, and even my response to that gift through faith is a gift, does that mean I get to do whatever I want now? Now, for a second, let's, let's practice our, our empathy with the objection. Right? Let's, let's think about it a little bit, because most of the time when people say this, they're saying, well, you know what? If, if I seem to know people, they'll say, who claim to understand grace, who claim to believe in Jesus, but whose lives are lived in a way that makes me say, you know, if that's a Christian, I'm not sure the world needs many more of these. Right? The objection comes because it's assumed or it's feared that if people are freely given their eternity, their, their salvation secured, if it's freely given to them with no regard to their efforts or their contribution, if they don't contribute something, then it logically follows that they're just going to become a soft, lazy, presumptuous, entitled, arrogant. And the reason why that fear is not an outlandish fear is because absent something supernatural happening in us, that is exactly what we would do with it. It's not an outlandish fear. To say, like, well, if you're just giving it freely, you're just going to abuse it. It's not an outlandish fear because absent something happening in us to change our hearts, that is exactly what we would do with a free gift. Isn't it ironic, then, that Paul says that the gift of salvation is not dependent on our works, verse 9, so that no one can boast. It would produce arrogance, but that is not actually, if rightly understood, what the grace of God through faith does. It's given to us to prevent boasting. That's pretty practical. If salvation is all a gift, then what that means is that one who truly understands that this grace is undeserved, that it comes at a great cost to us, when we truly understand that, then it completely removes any ground, any basis for our finding any kind of reason to be arrogant about anything. Remember last week I told you the story uh, if you were here, about, um, about this guy in Plano, Texas who was pulled over by a police officer. He had an expired vehicle registration, and the officer not only didn't write him a ticket, but gave him the money so that he could register his car. Now, freely given, right? That's what we, that, was the, that was the point. Here's an example of grace. But you can imagine the response of someone who might say, who didn't really understand the implications of what he had been given, who might, who might like say thank you to the officer and then go home to his buddies and be like, ha <laughs> guess what I just got out of? It was awesome, right? But what happened? What did the guy do? He just broke down and cried. And then he went out and he got his vehicle registered. The officer wasn't checking up on him, but he did it. Why? Because he was overwhelmed by what had happened to him. He was changed. See, if you have, if you have this grace objection, right, what you, need me to, what you need to hear me say is this, right? Someone who claims that they understand grace and who claims to have faith, but then does whatever he wants, whatever she pleases, a person like that understands truly neither grace nor faith. Not really. 
Because see, real grace transforms the recipient. True faith leads not to boasting, but to humble obedience. God offers the gift of salvation to us by grace, point number one. We receive it through faith, point number two. For us, point number three, to do good works. Look at verse 10. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Right now, here's the critical understanding of how our good works relate to our salvation. Salvation is not from works, but that doesn't mean that works are absent that they don't matter. In fact, it's the opposite. God's works, he's, Paul's saying here, are an essential component of what it means to be a Christian because they're the evidence that grace has truly been received through faith. Now, we obviously can't go through it in detail here, but the second half of the book of Ephesians is Paul doing exactly that. He goes through chapters 4, 5, and 6, and he lays out this is what a Christian ought to look like. These are the types of things that they ought to be doing. But the reason why 4, 5, and 6 don't become, come before chapters 1, 2, and 3 is because 1, 2, and 3 is the basis, the transformative basis for why the acts of obedience in 4, 5, and 6 are able to happen. But how? How do you do them? Right? This is an important, important question because if you've ever tried out of your own strength to obey all the commandments that God has given you, you'll realize pretty quickly that it can be a frustrating exercise. I think that's what I assumed my junior year when I first understood grace. I understood it, but I kind, of, I kind of had this notion of like, all right, God, thanks for the gift. Now it's up to me, right? It's like he had handed off the ball, and it was up for me to kind of continue the race to the, to the, to the goal line. It sounds very noble, very American kind of thing to say, right? All right, pick it up. Run the rest of the way. Problem is, it didn't take me very long to trip and stumble, to fall, right? Which is why I need the encouragement of verse 10 that says, <laughs> that we're created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See, even here, even here with the importance that Paul's placing on the role of good works, he's not actually saying that we can claim any credit for them. He's not saying that they come from us. God prepared good works for us that we should then walk in them. Now, that's a very interesting phrase, the way to end verse 10, that we should walk in them, because if you look back at verse one of Ephesians chapter two, the Ephesians were walking then too, right? Before the grace of God had been shown to them, Paul says in verse one, they were walking, right? But they were walking differently. Here in verse 10, to highlight the contrast with verse one, right? Paul says, you now have good works for you to walk in, which contrasts with the sins of verse one in which you once walked. Now remember, we, had, we said this before, but verses 1 to 10 in Ephesians chapter 2 is all one big long sentence in the original text, the original Greek. And so by bookending verse 1 and verse 10 with this idea of walking, Paul's making a very important point. He's showing the contrast of how you walked before and how you walk now. Because he says before, verse 1, when you were dead, you walked in sin. Now that you're alive, you walk in righteousness. Before, you walked in bad works. Now, you walk in good works. That's the contrast he's making. Then, bad works. Now, good works. And what's the difference? What's, what's happened? What, what has happened in between? You were made alive. That's the difference. See, good works necessarily follow our salvation because our salvation is a recreation in Christ Jesus. A Christian is someone who is different than they were before fundamentally, from the core. God's workmanship recreated in the way that we were originally intended to be. And all the good works that Christians are called to do and must do then are the result of God's prior working in them. The grace of God transforms our attitudes, transforms our behaviors, so that now we do walk differently. Now, how do we do them? Right? Paul's letter to Titus, chapter 2, he goes through and he explains in, in, in much greater detail. He says, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. And he goes through this long list of things that we are now able to do. What is the trainer, he says? It's the grace of God. And so when we fall ourselves falling out of line with what God commands us to do, it means that we should go back to our coach. 
which is the grace of God that has been shown to us in Jesus Christ. See, here's the, here's the ironic answer to the grace, question, uh, the grace objection that says, okay, if I'm saved by grace through faith and it's all a gift and it's nothing I do, does that mean that I get to do whatever I want? See, here's the ironic answer that you can kind of wink at somebody with. You, you know what they're saying, and so you have to engage. But, but, but at a very real level, what you can say is, yes, that's exactly what it means. Increasingly and progressively, that's exactly what it means. When you know that you are saved by grace through faith and that it is a gift, you will get to do exactly what you want to do. Because increasingly and progressively over time, that's exactly what God is doing in each of our hearts. Transforming our desires so that we want to do what God wants us to do. So that over time, the tension that we feel between what we want and what God wants diminishes. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't encounter situations, oftentimes, where we don't want to do what God commands us to do. And I want you to hear me very clearly. In that instance, what you should not say is, well, maybe I'll just wait for the feeling to come along. My desire isn't quite there yet, so I think I'll just wait for the desire and I'll sin in the meantime. No. You obey. And you obey out of faith at that moment, if not out of desire. But what it should be for you, that lack, of, that lack of desire to obey, that lack of wanting what God wants at that moment, that lack of the, what that should be for you is like the little light in your car, the warning light that comes on. Before the car veers off the road, before the engine stops, that says something's wrong that you should check out. Right? When your heart is not there, it's a warning light that God is giving you. It says you need to revisit your understanding of the doctrine of grace. The hymn writer, William Cooper, wrote of the struggle in his own heart. And this is what he said. He said, How long beneath the law I lay in bondage and distress. I toiled the precept to obey, but toiled without success. Then, to abstain from outward sin, outward sin. There was more than I could do. Now, if I feel its power, power of sin, he says, now if I feel its power, I feel I hate it too. Then all my servile works were done a righteousness to raise. Now freely chosen in the Son, I freely choose His ways. To see the law by Christ fulfilled and hear His pardoning voice changes a slave into a child and duty into choice. You see? This is what changes us. This is what enables our good works, our obedience. To gaze upon the grace of God shown to us in Jesus Christ. To see the law by Christ fulfilled and hear his pardoning voice. Changes a slave into a child and duty into choice. Isn't that amazing? The Bible is so rich that this is written throughout the pages of the entire Bible. And yet, if all we had if the only portion of the Bible that we had to study was Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10, we would have more to marvel at than we could fit into a lifetime of study and meditation. This is what God has done for us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the grace that you have shown to us and what is now our opportunity to celebrate it together in the sacrament of the Lord's table. Lord, we pray that with this representation of your sacrifice on our behalf, you would make it plain to us and apply this grace through faith to our lives and to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. In a week where division may be quite evident in our nation, and certainly just in terms of the empirical facts of voting. There will be people who choose different sides of all kinds of issues. What we need to recognize is that at this table, we are united by far more in Jesus Christ than anything that divides us. The people of God, whether we are a poor, persecuted woman in the Central African Republic or a suburban, middle-class person in Northeast America, is united by far more than what divides us. And this table is an evidence and a picture of that. 
Jesus himself instituted this table and he wrote, he said this, written by the Apostle Paul, is recorded in 1 Corinthians 11. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, Paul says, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. This is a community celebration of God's people. And so you needn't be a member of Calvary Presbyterian Church in order to participate here, but you ought to have made a public profession of faith in the doctrines and the teachings of the gospel that we've just explained. You ought to have done that publicly before Christ's church and not be prohibited by Christ's church from participating in the table. But if that's not you, or you're still struggling or wrestling with the gospel as it's been explained, then don't think for a second that you're here or you're watching this by chance, fate, or mistake, or that you are unwelcome to be a participant. But your participation is to be in a different sense. Instead of partaking of the elements as they're passed, we encourage you, in line with the warning given by the Apostle Paul, to allow the elements to pass by. But use the opportunity, the words being sung in the song that will be played as the elements are distributed, the, the, the symbolism and the, and the meaning and the presence of Christ in this moment, allow them to speak to your heart and to challenge your understanding of who Jesus is. I want to invite the elders who are here to come up and Help us if Joe and Van could come up and stand with me. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for this sacrament that we're about to participate in, and we ask that you would bless it to us. Set aside this bread and this cup. Use them to be instruments of grace in our hearts. The means of grace by which we understand and know your presence more deeply and clearly in our lives. Allow them to strengthen our faith for your service in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to do this in the way that we have done it recently. There is the two-in-one communion cup here. A thin film of cellophane on the top that if peeled back will uh, allow you access to the, uh, the wafer, the bread. And then a solid plastic tab, if pulled, that will give you access to the juice inside. The elders will distribute along with me the elements and we ask that you to take them, hold on to them. And then when we come back together, we'll partake together. If uh, you have a dietary need or are more interested in a gluten-free uh, option, then this wafer is not gluten-free, but take this because it's got the juice anyway. And then there are gluten-free wafers that are in the tray as well and you can take one of those in addition. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace. God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Sin and despair like the sea waves go. Threaten the soul with infinite loss. Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold. Points to the refuge, the mighty cross. 
Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Dark is a stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide. Whiter than snow you may be today. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, this is my body which is given for you. Take and eat, and as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. So ministering to you now, take and eat, and know the forgiveness that comes through the body of Christ. In the same way, Jesus took the cup and he gave it to his disciples and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you and for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink and as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. And so take and drink and know the forgiveness that comes through the blood of Christ. Let me invite you to stand as I pronounce benediction, God's blessing as you go, and then we will stand and continue standing and sing together the doxology as we close. Now may the grace and peace given to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present age, be with you according to the will of God our Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah.